you've also got to get an interaction with that, so that's with the 20-year-olds. There's a greater increase in the liberality of 20-year-old sexual attitudes from 1960 to 1980 than there is in the liberality of 50-year-old sexual attitudes from 1960 to 1980. Both, Are you saying that because of the slopes? Yeah. They both increase, but as you can see, you also by looking at the gap, the gap is bigger mm -hmm. here. I figure that people in their 50s already have whatever attitudes they have towards sex. Although, I work with some couples where uh, one of the things that happen in this period is you know, because like Masters and Johnson and Kinsey stuff coming out becoming really popular and, and then getting out in the popular media, you know, those of you who were who are later born than myself may not understand that there was a time when every issue of Cosmo did not have articles about the female orgasm. <laughs> it's true, I, so I remember this. And I, I worked with couples who were alive during that period. In fact, we're into middle age, past 40, in this time period, and discovered the female orgasm in here. And were much happier afterwards <laughs> than they were before. It's kind of, it's like, you know, 50-year-olds can make a more change than this would suggest on average. <laughs> so, got the basic idea? Really? Yeah. Yeah. You guys are, like, way smarter than previous cohorts. <laughs> <laughs> they do it like I know with the asthma studies they've done it for cohorts that have um, followed um, like pollution um, or the fires or something like the fires when they've had the big fires in the <coughs> so you pick a cohort based on a um, similar historical exposure yeah risk exposure like students for professionals like it's yeah, it, they're just not all the same in age. So it's like an exposure, I guess, exposure over yeah. like more picking them. It could be just about any yeah. my, 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 I, mean, I may not understand this in enough detail, but my sense is better than that literature. It could be just about any definition. It's, it's sort of a synonym for group, in a sense. It's a defined group. That, or, or is it more specific to risk? No, it, it's a group that you're following. So cohort design, you're just following a group, yeah. and, and that's the, the cohort that you follow in it. Yeah. Usually it is on age, but sometimes they do it. Yeah, no, this, this would be a more specific use of, of, of a cohort word um, that you would see in any, any of the sort of lifespan, sequential design, sort of literature. So I think it would span at least, at least psych and so. So I don't know if biologists ever do this stuff. So much. I can't think of examples that I've seen. I've seen biological variables in <coughs> sort of social science, behavioral science studies. I've seen purely biological studies. I the kind of science. So now it is a kind of, as tends to help, it's kind of a specific use of a term that can certainly be used more generally. But it's always birth cohort. Um, yeah, I think in this literature okay. it's always, it's always virtual. In order to make that distinction about being... You know, I, I know, I yeah. just thought it was strange, but I can't think of any time I've ever come across it not being a birth Well, I, I don't think it's only psychology, or there's even general psychology. I think it's more it's sort of lifespan, developmental, psych, lifespan. 
Tell us, life course sociology. Where you where you doing the kind of sequential design approach to thinking about aging and cohort design, and then also like in the uh, sort of sociological theory, social philosophy, like Glenn Elder's kind of work is more uh, qualitative uh, sociology. Kind of thinking about, he writes a lot about the generations, of the new generations. He's one of the first people to to do that. Isn't it just a perfect thing to have people be a major figure in gerontology, elder? <laughs> Actually, when I, when I was in graduate school, there was a guy who did a lot of the work on neuroscience who, who was uh, Lord Brain. He was a British researcher. His last name was Brain, and he got cited, so he was Lord Brain. <laughs> so, not to wonder what dreams or destiny. Anything else about... How, how, how the whole, we're going to be doing kind of specific examples of intelligence and personality over the next couple of weeks, but just in terms of feeling fairly clear about what these concepts are and how you get that from the numbers are sort of there. It's like you go into confusion about something else. Sure. <laughs> okay. So, um, <laughs> Did this scare people? Or? <laughs> Felicia was talking about a paper that was doing. My paper scary. was on this stuff, and I was like trying to understand it. And okay. yes. Yeah, was, Another know. week. And, and <laughs> it wasn't happening. <laughs> 20 minutes from now, it just be so clear. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> okay. Um, So how things get measured, um, in psychology and social sciences, um, in principle anyway, you know, what, what we're interested in is ideas, concepts, constructs that, that have some kind of real world reality. and. Um, and so we want to we want to know what these things are. We want to measure them in some way because that's sort of the essential principle of science that anything that exists exists in some measurable quantity. Francis Bacon said that, and sometimes I say kept quoting him. <clears throat> and so, uh, although it does, and I. Those of you that are in the Jiro PhD anyway may either have or will have the opportunity to get the ring about this at some length in the theories course that um, we don't always think real carefully about how good our measures actually are in terms of what the units are and so forth. But um, so we most of the stuff that we want to know in the social sciences, you end up having to ask people. Some of the stuff you can you can sort of see what people do, and then of course, in, if you're using biomarkers, you sort of get these measurements that have more of a um, sort of more of a physical reality, and therefore people tend to have a lot of confidence in them. Um, Although it's actually sort of interesting that biomarkers are often at least as variable and error-ridden and unreliable as psychological measures, and many of them are actually a whole lot worse uh, in terms of actual like reliability over time and so forth. They the, uh, just aren't. Um, I'm not saying that only because of the psychologist. I'm saying this is somebody who's tried to use biomarkers in research and profoundly disappointed more than once. How well they perform. Um, but anyway, <clears throat> we may keep trying. We do keep trying. Um, so we ask people stuff. We try to figure out whether the measures are good measures of what we're measuring. And um, one of the things that tends to be different, one of the things psychology as a discipline actually tends to focus on a lot more 